Will you take your Bibles, please, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be strong in grace. And we'll be reading the first 13 verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 1 to 13. Be strong in grace. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Let's look to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you for your wonderful word. And Lord, I would pray that the real strength of the grace of our Lord might be evident to all of us as our great need. There are so many struggles and so many difficulties in the Christian life. There are so many things that we must face inevitably every week of our lives that demands the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may we find that strength that many of us have longed for and wanted. May we find that it is in Jesus and not in our own efforts and performance. May there be a sweet release in the hearts of all of us who struggle and fight the good fight of faith, to know that there is grace available that will sustain us no matter what the trial, no matter what the pain or difficulty. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I once again remind you where Paul is. The dungeon, the Mamertine prison, rat infested, filled with disease, cold. He wanted his cloak to warm him there. It was not a pleasant place, and not many people were supporting him in that hour of his need. And he spoke about many who had deserted him, whom he thought were friends. And it was a very difficult time for the Apostle Paul, and it was his last time, for he was executed uh, following this experience of writing Second Timothy. And as we read this, these are final words. These are words that a man who had walked with God for many, many years wanted to impart, especially to Timothy, but to all the people of God. And therefore, they're very serious words. If you like to outline, we're going to deal with four things here. In the opening two verses, there's an exhortation that all of us should heed to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In verses 3 to 6, there are three examples that we should follow. A soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And then in verses 7 to 10, there's an evaluation that we should make to consider what Paul is saying and to understand the point. And then finally, there is encouragement that we all should receive in verses 11 to 13. Let's back up and take a look at the exhortation to be strong in grace. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 4, please, and look at verse 20. Romans chapter 4, verse 20. We all have a need of spiritual strength. The question is, where does it come from? And I don't know if you've tried to do it in yourself, but you will quickly run out of gas. It won't work, but we all try. We hardly know the difference between the strength that the Lord gives and the strength that we have in and of ourselves. It's very hard to draw the line there. You can sometimes minister for the Lord in what you think is his strength only to discover that it was not his strength at all. And there's a very important point here made in chapter 2, verse 1, that every believer, no matter how much we minister for the Lord, must see. God's strength resides in grace. And that's a very difficult thing to come to because we are all programmed to law. 
We're programmed to certain things that we want to accomplish or to see accomplished. And we believe that the strength that we need can be gotten by a certain formula or a certain series of steps. And if we will just take these steps, somehow we will be strong in the Lord. But God's strength has always been in the arena of grace. In Romans chapter 4, this same word to be strong, to be empowered, is used of Abraham. In chapter 4, I read in verse 19 that not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. In other words, he's impotent. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, she's barren. He didn't even look at that. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Same word in 2 Timothy 2, 1, to be strong in grace. He was strengthened in faith. And, and why was that? Verse 21, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. And I thought to myself, you know, it seems that you have to come to the end of your resources before you can understand the strength that God wants to give you. You have to come to the end of that. You have to, like Abraham, look at yourself and say, hey, dead than a doornail, impotent completely in the work of God. And he looked at Sarah and she's barren. There's no hope for any productivity to come or any fulfillment of the promise of God in their lives. But he was strong in faith and gave glory to God and was fully convinced that God could do it. And that's the way it is always. We have to come to the point that we do not trust ourselves, but we understand that God can give us the strength that we are lacking. There's another passage I'd like you to turn to, and that's in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Just beginning with the whole idea of that exhortation to be strong in the grace that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 6.10 also uses that same word to be strong and certainly needs to be applied to what we're reading in 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says 6.10 of Ephesians, finally, my brethren, be strong. That's the word in 2 Timothy 2.1. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And the reason is clearly outlined because we are in fact in a very serious spiritual struggle. Sometimes we see that struggle as with other believers. And yet the Bible's clear that it is not that that is the problem. The problem is there are spiritual enemies of our soul who are doing all they can to tear us down so that we will not trust in the Lord himself. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 again. The whole passage begins with therefore. You therefore my son. And you, again, whenever you see therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. So you look back into the text preceding it. What is the point here? Well, if you have been with us in our study, you know that the main emphasis of the first chapter is to not be ashamed. That God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. So don't be ashamed. In other words, in the light of the admonitions to not be ashamed, here's what we need. Spiritual strength. Be strong in the grace that is in our Lord. And, and when we are ashamed, it's because we are not strong in the Lord. Perhaps we've been trusted in ourselves and we have caused now to be embarrassed, either because we were weak and failed to do what God wanted us to do, or because we in fact could not share as we should have shared with perhaps a friend who needed Christ. Do not be ashamed. What causes the timidity and fear? It's a lack of spiritual strength. So you must tie the passage together. It flows together. Therefore, be strong. Therefore, in the light of the need to not be ashamed, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. There are three things that I have you notice about the exhortation in verse 1 and 2. One is the relationship that Paul had to Timothy. You, therefore, my son. Technon, my little born one. Reminding him that he led him to Christ. And he ought to know what the need is in his life. The second thing I'd like you to see is that the resource that provides the strength that we need is stated to be grace. And that's not easy to comprehend. That's not easy to understand. What, in fact, does it mean to be strong in grace? Well, it's obviously the opposite of works. And the point of this passage is that the tendency of the believer is to allow his own works and performance to be the strength that he uses in order to serve the Lord. And the text is saying, no, you are strong in grace. 
Romans 5 says that having been justified by faith, we have peace with God and we have access into this grace in which we stand. Now, grace gives us what we don't deserve. Grace gives us that which we do not have ourselves. And the spiritual strength we all need to serve the Lord is coming from grace. God's grace gives us what we do not have. And I don't know about you, but I see often the need of of God's strength. I see that constantly in my life. And I know that it has to come from grace. Now, turn to Galatians chapter 2, and let me show you a little insight on this, just trying to expand our understanding of how we are strong in grace, the grace that is in Christ. Turn to Galatians chapter 2, and look what it says in verse 20 and 21. Galatians is a book that contrasts grace and law, grace and works. And in Galatians 2, 20 and 21, we have a tremendous passage for every believer I have been crucified with Christ. That's what it says. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Every one of these phrases is packed with meaning and depth. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. How did Abraham get strong? He grew strong in faith, did not waver. He knew that God could give him what he could not produce himself. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside or frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. You see, we have to be strong in the grace of our Lord for one obvious reason. It's the only way it comes. And if you decide to go your own way, to use your own work system, your own performance, to somehow serve the Lord in your own strength, what you're doing is setting aside the grace of God. And God allows you to experience the consequence of that. Do you frustrate God's grace right now? Are you motoring on your own strength? Are you trying to achieve what you want in your life, what you think God wants in your own efforts? Be strong in the grace of that is in Jesus Christ. Do not lay it aside because the whole issue of the Christian life is Christ lives in me. Now let me give you another example. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. The resource that provides the strength we need is described as being grace that is in Christ Jesus. And there's no other way. God must give you what you cannot deserve or earn. There's no way to get it except through trust and complete confidence and faith in him, exactly like Abraham did. It cannot be your efforts. It has to be his. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, I read this. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Grow in grace. You can develop in grace. You can become strong in grace. Now back to 2 Timothy, please, and look at chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 again. We're talking about an exhortation that we all need to heed to be strong in the grace of our Lord. We looked at the relationship Paul had to Timothy, which made that very important and critical to Paul as he looked at Timothy's life, seeing what Timothy was facing, knowing his tendency towards timidity and fear, and he warns him not to be ashamed, but what he needs is God's strength, and the resource that gives that is God's grace. Then the third thing to notice in verse 2 is the responsibility that we all have to that strength which God gives. And it can be summarized with three things. Look at verse 2 again. The navigators used this verse many years ago to develop the whole concept of discipleship. And a lot of people use this passage to teach discipleship, but I want you to look at this carefully. It says, And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. There are really three things that comprise our responsibility here. One is to listen. To listen. Paul said, you have heard from me among many witnesses. He is not saying that he sat down and taught Timothy in a discipleship class. I can understand the value of that, and I appreciate that. But that is not what it is saying in this text. The very words, the things you've heard from me, the word from, para in Greek, is alongside of. Timothy was there to keep his mouth shut and to learn from Paul. 
And all he did was heard Paul as he proclaimed the gospel to people, and he was right alongside and listening to him. You have heard from me among many witnesses. You saw it on many occasions, Timothy. Now, what was he seeing? And this is where I think a lot of people have misunderstood the point of 2 Timothy 2 2. What he was seeing was a man that was beat up, that was criticized, that experienced a lot of persecution and flack, who was constantly experiencing a hostile crowd, who once was left for dead, who describes all of these things in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and it's exhausting to read the list. Here's a man that would not have been your favorite person for salesman of the year. This is Paul. And Paul has suffered enormously, and he is not popular, and nobody likes him. The things that you have heard alongside of me among many witnesses. What's the whole argument here? The argument is about enduring and suffering so you won't be ashamed. And a lot of us fold up when one person doesn't like what we say. Or somebody didn't like uh, the fact that we're Christians in a certain environment. And we back off and we get ashamed. The whole message that Paul leaves with the Christian community as he faces his own death is don't be ashamed. There are lots of afflictions. There are lots of persecutions, but it's worth it all to serve the Lord, no matter what comes to you. And a lot of us fold up. See, in a free society, we don't have to be pressured with this passage. We can go to work tomorrow and just kind of cool it through the week and not pay a whole lot of attention. But most Christians around the world know exactly what he's saying, and they desperately need it, and you need it too. We just don't know until the pressure comes. What he's saying is, Timothy, you listen to me. You have seen what happened to me. You have a responsibility to listen, to observe very carefully what goes on in the people who do walk with the Lord and do have the strength of the Lord. And it doesn't come through easy times. Number two, not only to listen, but to commit. He said, the things that you've heard from me, commit these to faithful men. Now turn back to verse 12 of chapter 1. The same word was used here. Paul said, for this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. That word committed to him is the same exact word in verse 2 of chapter 2, commit to faithful men. Look at verse 14. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Again, the same word committed that's in chapter 2, verse 2. It literally means to deposit, to deposit like a trust. And it normally refers to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have not seen the normal interpretation of discipleship in 2 Timothy 2, 2 to be in light of the context. The context of 2 Timothy is for us not to be ashamed of the gospel, that there's a world that desperately needs Christ, and we are in fact to be strong in the strength that God gives so that we can stand and withstand against all that will come our way, all the efforts of the enemy to stop us. Listen, Paul says, to what, remember what went on, and then commit yourself to faithful men. You've got to do the same thing. You've got to entrust what I entrusted to you to them. And that trust is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, the last phrase proves the point. We not only listen, we not only commit, but we are to teach or to train. It says, commit these to faithful men, men of faith, who will be able to teach others also. And one of the surprising things about that text is the word others is not the word meaning another of the same kind. Please listen to me carefully, people. The normal interpretation that Christians give of 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, that this is a discipleship context. So what we're doing is discipling people who show that they are going to be faithful to the Lord and will be able to teach other believers as well. So we reduplicate ourselves by discipleship. I appreciate all that, but you cannot prove it in the text because the others is not the other of the same kind, meaning other believers, but it's heteros, referring to others who are totally different and therefore need the gospel. And if we follow through the text, what he's saying is, Timothy, you were alongside of me. You heard what I said. You saw all that the gospel is and all the conflicts now deposit it in the lives of of faithful men who will be able to teach what others who are believers no others who are lost therefore the whole point of discipling is really a discipling for evangelism and to train those that you have influence in 
and on, to be not ashamed of the gospel and to recognize you are going to get struggle, flack, hostility, and trouble. And that's the whole point of this. That's why he says in the very next verse, you must endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, a lot of us listening to this don't want it. We don't want it. No wonder we remain quiet. Because the moment you decide to speak up for the Lord, let me tell you something. People do not like it. They don't like it. And he says, endure hardship. So sometimes even in our presentation, we'll water it down because we don't want to offend Aunt Emma. Uh, we, we want to water it down just to, because Uncle Harry doesn't like it. And, and please make it a quick prayer because you know how they feel at holiday time. On and on it goes. We make excuses. And here this passage says, hey, I'm in the Mamertine prison. I'm in the dungeon. I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. My dear friends, do not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It was because of Paul's persecutions and his endurance of that that led in Philippians chapter 1 the believers to get bold in their faith and witness and said, we can witness also. And if we have to join him in prison, great. But let's don't compromise our message. Do not be ashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Quite a passage. It may be a little bit different than you thought when we started. There's an exhortation here that we need to heed, and that's to be strong. Spiritual strength for what? To be the witness that God wants you to be. The main priority on the heart of God. The main thing he's doing in these last days since the day of Pentecost until he comes again is drawing people to himself. I want to just share my heart with you tonight, okay? It's something that I've been bothered about for a long, long time. I am absolutely convinced that the devil has pulled the wool over the eyes of most Christians in this country. And what he has done is very subtle, but he has gotten us so involved with helping ourselves develop and grow and get discipled that we literally have lost a heart for the lost and dying community around us. Evangelism is going out the window. I hear over and over again from people in churches, they never hear the gospel anymore. Pastors tell me they they don't have anybody there who are lost and need need the Savior. That's simply not true. But but evangelism is nowhere uh, to be found today. And it's, it's like, well, as soon as Billy Graham dies, it's all over. My dear friends, God wants you to be a witness and to share Jesus Christ with people more than anything else in your life. The Great Commission has not changed. You can't disciple anybody that is not saved. The first priority is evangelism, always before edification. Edification is needed. We need to grow. We need to get our act together. But why do we need to get our act together? Why are we encouraging each other? Why are we trying to build each other up and save marriages and put families back together? Why are we doing this? So that we all can be more of a credible witness for our Lord and see lost men and women saved. We better get our act together on this. Something is deeply wrong in the body of Christ. Evangelism is relegated to a few people who maybe once in a while go out and share their faith, and perhaps even in an organized way. God wants us to witness every day of our lives, every person that we come in contact with, whether it's just the sweetness of a smile or whether it's the actual words and a great opportunity to tell them about Jesus and your love for Him. I'm afraid many people have read this passage wrong. They have not read the entire book. They have not seen the context or the burden of a man sitting in prison and begging us to not be ashamed of the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's look at the examples we should follow. There are three of them. Verses 3 to 6. The soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. What about the soldier? There's an issue with each one of these. Three illustrations, three issues. What's the issue of the soldier? Very simply put, it's the issue of commitment. How committed are you? In the case of the athlete, the issue is morality, and I'll show you that in a moment. In the case of the farmer, the issue is reward. When you set out to serve the Lord and be the witness that he wants you to be wherever you are in life, there are three issues you have to face, commitment, morality, and reward. The soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. Let's back up, take a look at the soldier. Commitment in the life of a soldier involves three things. Problems that he has to face, endure hardship, verse 3. Priorities, 
The text says no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. More about that in a minute. And purpose. Why are you doing it? That he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Let's back up and take a look at problems. Problems often keep us from commitment. We see the problems first. We see the difficulties. We see the resentment. We see the hostility. And that often causes us not to be faithful to the Lord. That's why he brought up the soldier. The soldier has no choice. He's got to be committed. He's been enlisted to be so. And he must endure hardship. By the way, turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and look at verse 18. Paul's made it very, very clear that this is no party time for Christians. It's not a bed of roses. Paul's made it very clear that there is a war. In 1 Timothy 1.8, he said, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Paul's told him frequently that he's in a fight. He's in a battle. He's got to endure hardship. Uh, look at chapter 2 Timothy chapter 4, in the last chapter, and verse 5. In his final instruction to Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4, 5, look at what he said. He said, you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions. Paul doesn't say trouble is going to happen to just a few of us. Paul says that we all are going to have trouble. And the question is, can we hack it or can we not? Can you hang in there when somebody doesn't like what you say and what you believe? Endure afflictions. The soldier has a commitment he has to fulfill, and he's got problems to face in that. Let's come back to chapter 2 again, and there's a matter of priorities. It says, no one engaged in warfare, which he had mentioned in his first epistle to Timothy, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself. The word means to weave in. He doesn't get wrapped up in it, we would say in our vernacular. He, he doesn't become in bondage to it. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. What's the word affairs? It's our English word pragmatic. What it is referring to is the practical things that are necessary in order to make life what it is. Uh, go to the store, uh, go to the gas station, whatever it is, all the pragmatic affairs, no soldier can become in bondage to that. Never. And all of a sudden, the issue of priority comes up. Is it not true that many of us are wrapped up in just the business of living to the point that we miss that the priority is to take folks to heaven with us? And so that's not really on our minds. So we might go down to the laundromat to do our laundry and forget that God has us there on divine appointments and maybe there's somebody there that we need to share Christ with. We can never let the pragmatic affairs of life, we can never let that become the dominant thing. Because the moment we do, it takes over and it messes up your priority. So you don't know why you're here. You don't know what you're doing. And that happens to so many of us. And a lot of Christians who go on like that will say, I just really don't feel any direction in my life. I don't feel any meaning or purpose. Well, what's happened there is you've lost sight of the priorities. No one engaged in warfare, and that's what we're in, entangles himself in the affairs of this life. The word entangle is used in 2 Peter 2.20 for people who are literally overcome with sensuality to the point it dominates and controls their life. That's just one illustration. Don't let the pragmatic affairs of life completely dominate you and lose the priority. What are we here for? What does God want us to do? I believe this so strongly that I believe that if it were not true, that the best thing God could do the moment you get saved is take you home. Why leave you here? It would make an interesting service, wouldn't it? <laughs> Folks get saved and boom, man, as soon as they confess Christ, zap to heaven. Of course, the question would be, why would we be here having the service if that were true? But anyway, <laughs> let's move to the matter of purpose. He has problems. He has to endure hardship. He has a priority. Don't become engaged with the affairs of this life, the practical matters of life. And there's a purpose involved. And that always affects commitment. What is the purpose? The purpose isn't to be a great evangelist. The purpose isn't to have a lot of opportunities. The purpose isn't just to show how well you know the gospel. That isn't the purpose. What's the purpose? That he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. It's because God wants you to do it. You want to please the Lord in this. No one else. To do what he wants you to do. You want to hear from him those sweet words one day. Well done, Thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. To please the Lord 
is the most important purpose any one of us can have, and that will strengthen commitment. Your commitment will get stronger if your purpose is to please the Lord. And commitment, friends, is sometimes saying no as well as yes. Commitment is saying no to something that will tear you down or hurt the cause of of what God wants to do through your life. And you've got to say no. You don't want to become entangled with the affairs of life because you want to please him who called you to be a soldier. Let's move to the athlete. I said the issue was morality. And you might say, well, how did you get that? Verse 5. It says, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Why is it that some of us do not do what God wants us to do? It's because we're not playing according to the rules. I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to show you something. Paul frequently uses athletics to teach us Important principles that we need to understand. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and look at verses 24 to 27. The issue of an athlete is always morality. Now, athletes, unfortunately, are not being told that as well as they should today. I realize that. But the issue in athletics is always morality. In every game, in every context, there are rules. And you've got to follow the rules. You can't break the rules and get away with it. They only do that, as I see it, in wrestling. But in most sports and most activities, you have got to play according to the rules. You cannot break the rules. It's an issue of morality. There is an ethical framework, an ethical system in which you're going to enjoy that contest and enjoy that game. And you can't violate. You may argue with a referee who is uh, maybe uh, reflecting on the fact that you broke a rule when you don't think you did. But the fact of the matter is every athlete knows that in order for that game to be what it ought to be, it's got to be rules. And it's very interesting in 1 Corinthians 9. Listen to this, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate, controlled, disciplined in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. Something that doesn't last, just a little trophy to put in your case, going to one day be destroyed. But we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight, not as one who beats the air. There's real purpose in this. Verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, which every athlete does. Why? Lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. What a fascinating point. Let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You see, when we talk about not being ashamed of the gospel and being strong in the grace of our Lord and looking at the examples, the soldier emphasizes commitment, but the athlete morality. And I can't break the rules of God or the disciplines of God in order to achieve what God wants me to do. Otherwise, I'll be put on the shelf and I'll be disqualified and my life will not become effective for the Lord. So there are certain limitations that God places on us. Paul doesn't get into the discussions of what those rules are in this particular text. But every believer, as he grows in the Lord, begins to understand some of those parameters and limitations. There are some things that some people can do that you can't do because you've got to please him who called you to be the soldier. And sometimes those things are point blank sin and you've got to get it out of your life or otherwise you will not be effective for the Lord. You will not be strong in the grace of our Lord. There's one other issue and that's the farmer. I was just in some farming territory and again reminded of the farmer's role and and what he really looks forward to. And on the heart and mind of every farmer is the issue of reward. And listen to this, verse 6. The hard-working farmer, and every farmer breaks his back. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. I began to look at that. You know, there are many, many views of that particular verse in the various commentators of 2 Timothy. And I'm not going to give you all the various views, but I want to just say this to you. The benefit may not only be future reward, which a lot of people immediately read in here. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. In other words, stay with the stuff 
and God will one day reward you, and I believe that. But the benefit may not only be in future reward, but as I looked at the context, it's also the joy of faithfulness to the Lord and the blessing of touching the lives of others now so that the crops, the lives of people who are being affected for the Lord, the farmer's the first to partake of it who's been doing the work, and that is always true. And what joy is in the heart of everyone who's been faithful to the gospel to see the fruit of the gospel, to see people coming to know Christ. Christ as Lord and Savior. It's not simply in future reward, that's true, but it's also in the joy of being faithful to Christ and seeing the results of what God does now through your faithfulness to Him in spite of all the afflictions and hassles you face. Interesting, huh? Let's come to verses 7 to 10. The evaluation we should make. You've heard about the exhortation that we should heed to be strong in the grace of our Lord. You've seen the examples we should follow, the soldier, the athlete, the farmer. Now, what's the evaluation we should make? Verse 7 begins, consider what I say. It's an interesting phrase in Greek. I think the best way to say it in English would be grasp the meaning. The suggestion is that you would be reading this and missing it. The point of the statement is that a lot of people read these verses and do not go away with the major point. So what the verse 7 is doing is saying, grasp it, and by the way, the Lord has to give you that understanding. The Lord has to give you understanding as to what this is really all about. And there are three things I'd like you to see about the evaluation that Paul's asking us to make. Verses 7 to 10. Three things. Number one, in verse 8 and 9. Our struggles are often the result of what we believe. Do you understand that? Reminds me of a new Christian who told me recently here that he said, you know, I I almost resent the fact I became a Christian. He said, my life was pretty all right until I became a Christian. Since I've become a Christian, I mean, all hell's broken out. Man, I got more trouble than I could... You know, and he's, he's expressing what a lot of us have seen happen to us, you know. It's almost a, a, an axiom, a principle, that when you come to really know the Lord and you get excited about the Lord, let me tell you, you are going to have trouble. <laughs> and a lot of us have had it. And what is Paul saying? The struggles are often the result of what we believe. If you don't know that, maybe you're not really sharing what you believe. Look at this again, verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer. I'm not doing evil, but they're saying I'm doing evil when I'm simply preaching the greatest message the world has ever heard. And I'm suffering trouble as a result of that. Our struggles are often the result of what we believe. He says, even to the point of chains, they put me in prison, and all I am preaching is that Jesus is the Messiah, that he arose from the dead, and I'm in jail over it. Back up again to verse 7. Consider what I say. Grasp the meaning. May the Lord give you understanding. Because what you believe will often bring struggles to your life will often bring trouble. The second thing is at the end of verse 9, and that is that the Scriptures are never limited by our struggles. Isn't that good news? He says, but the Word of God is not chained. Now, I may be in chain, I may be in prison, but I don't want you to get discouraged because the Word of God's not chained. Now, let me just describe to you again how powerful this is. Paul is now in his second imprisonment. His first imprisonment, he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. One of those books, Philippians, he mentions about how God used his prison ministry for his glory and shows you how the Word of God was not chained. And some people miss it because it's actually in the last few verses of Philippians chapter 4 when he says, All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's own household. Now, I don't know what you have thought about reading that little verse at the end of Philippians chapter 4, but I'm telling you, if you know anything about Roman history, you would have had to jump up and just shouted glory. Now, remember, he's in jail in the Praetorian guardhouse, not in the dungeon where he is in 2 Timothy. The Praetorian guardhouse is a nice facility. There are guards that come by every four hours. They are not to talk to prisoners. They are chained to them. 
just one hand. So Paul had a free hand to write. And every four hours, there's a guard coming. And Paul says, all the saints salute you, chiefly those that are in Caesar's own family. The Caesar was Nero. Nero, who flayed Christians alive. Nero has stuck them on torches in his gardens to light up his orgies and just burn them alive. Nero, one of the vicious, most brutal emperors who ever walked the face of the earth. It was Nero, and Paul said, hey, you're not going to believe this. (laughs) All the saints salute you, even those that are in Caesar's own family. I was sitting, several of you have heard this story before, but I was sitting in a class in college on the history of Rome, and we were studying the Roman emperors. And I was reading the information about how Nero murdered his wife, his mother-in-law, and several other relatives because they professed faith in Jesus Christ. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's own family. I don't know how he did it, but this is the way I think he did it. Because of what he said in chapter 1 of Philippians, that it was spreading and he was pioneering through the whole Praetorian guardhouse, he's making the assumption, uh, or at least we make the assumption hearing this, that the Apostle Paul was leading those soldiers to Christ. Now, the interesting thing is they're not supposed to talk or they could be killed. But, you know, Paul's a motor mouth. (laughs) And imagine having to stand. Can you imagine what was going on in the Roman soldier locker room if they had such a thing? Guys were saying, hey, have you been with that little Jew down there yet? I said, man, you, you you will not believe. He will talk incessantly for four solid hours. Can you imagine? Uh, Can you see Ephesians 6 looking at a Roman soldier? Hey, man, that's a neat helmet you got there. Boy, that red sash is something. That reminds me of the blood of Jesus Christ. I think I'll write that down. The helmet of salvation. Let me see that sword again. Boy, that's a sword of the Spirit. That's a word of God. Man, your shield is shiny. I bet you guys shine those all day long. That's what the righteousness of Christ is like, by the way. Breastplate of righteousness. Not a bad idea. I realize I stretched that a little bit. (laughs) But you figure it out. I get excited reading about that. And then to realize in his last epistle, he says, don't be ashamed. What an indictment on all of us. What an example he was to our hearts. It's really something, isn't it? The third thing that I point out to you about this evaluation you make, that our struggles are often the result of what we believe, but the scriptures are not limited by our struggles. And boy, that was evidence in the life of Paul. But the third thing is that the salvation of others makes all of our struggles worthwhile. Let me read that again. The salvation of others makes all our struggles worthwhile. That's why he's saying in verse 10, Therefore, I endure all things. Why? For the sake of the elect. He even knows that the burden isn't on him. Whoever's going to be saved has been chosen by God, but I don't know who they are. But I endure all things for the sake of the elect. Why? That they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's what it's all about. To see people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So I'll take all the flack. To God be the glory. Praise His wonderful name. Consider what I say. Paul said, you better take some time to think about this and grasp it, because when you start sharing your faith in Jesus Christ, there are going to be a lot of folks that wish you would get out of there. (laughs) They don't want to have you around anymore. Let's come to the final thing, the encouragement we should receive. We learn about the struggles and the trials, and we're not to be ashamed, but we need a little encouragement. The principle is that our need to suffer and struggle and endure now is going to be followed by future glory. So hang in there. That's what the encouragement is all about. It starts out in verse 11. This is a faithful saying. That means you can rely on it. It also indicates that this is perhaps an early hymn or a confession of the church. There are many of these. And this is another example. It's very possible this was a hymn which believers sang because it's just beautifully laid out. Poetic, very poetic. Now there are four if clauses here. Look at verse 11. If we died, verse 12. If we endure, if we deny, verse 13. If we are faithless. Now in if clauses in Greek, there are four kinds. And I don't want to bore you with that. I'll just tell you what the kind is. This particular construction means if and it is true. There is no probability here at all. We would translate in English since. So let's put that down in every one of them. 
Since you died with him, you'll live with him. Since you endure, you'll reign. And since you deny him, he'll deny you. And since you're faithless, he remains faithful. Now let's back up and say, what is it talking about? This is encouragement to all of us who are going to probably suffer and struggle. And he's telling us to not be ashamed and to hang in there. Now, what are these four issues in those four clauses? Number one, the resurrection of believers is guaranteed. Now, that is really important, folks, if you're in the Mamertine prison and you know you're going to be executed. It actually should be important to all of us. You see, the fear of man is a snare and a trap, the Bible says. What can they do to you? Well, they could kill me. Well, praise the Lord. I said they'd kill me. Well, I know. That'd be wonderful. Why? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And by the way, you're going to be resurrected. So relax. Didn't that encourage you? (laughs) Number two, not only is the resurrection of believers guaranteed, the reign of believers is promised. If we endure, and it's certain that you will, there's going to be hassles in life. If you endure, you hang in there, you bear up under the load, even though sometimes you ask, why do I have this load? I mean, why don't you put it on somebody else for a while? If we bear up under it, the Bible says we shall what? We'll reign with him. Can't get any better than that, can you? So the future glory is being used to encourage us in the present struggle. You know why that's so important to Americans? Because we want it now. We want it now, man. Show me the product now. Bless me now, Lord. The health, wealth, and success gospel prospers in this country because the narcissism of this country wants it now. Who wants to wait for future glory? You can talk about heaven all you want, but I want my goodies now. And that's what's keeping us from commitment to the Lord. We don't even know it. If you endure, and it's certain you're going to have to, remember you will reign with him. The third issue is kind of interesting because it's reversed. It's a negative in the midst of the positives. It says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. And what is he talking about here? He's talking about the result of eternal condemnation is based on our rejection of Jesus Christ. Nothing more and nothing less. So if you are a believer, the point is you have nothing to worry about. The only way you can ever lose your salvation, the only way you can ever be denied by the Lord, is if you, in fact, deny Him, which is the opposite of confessing Him as Lord and Savior. So it is a positive point. It depends on how you're reading it. The result of eternal condemnation is based on one thing alone, and that's the rejection of Jesus Christ. So the statement is not scaring the believer, the statement is encouraging the believer. All four statements are to encourage us to say, there is nothing else involved. You say, what if I get scared? What if I wound up in jail? What if I can't have the strength that Paul has? And what if I... Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God loves you. If you're saved, you're saved. (laughs) Hallelujah. Nothing can change you. The fourth thing is real precious, too. It says, if we are faithless, because there are some of this that that will happen to under great pressure. I've had the privilege, if you call it that, to meet people who are faithless under trial. And it, it, it has a deep impression upon me and still does to this day. And I saw this years ago. And I saw people in another culture in a society who, because of persecution, Scared to death, could not stand up for the Lord and compromise. And I saw the guilt and pain and agony on their faces. But I realized under that situation, a lot of us would have also done the same thing. What do we say to those people? We give them 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. What encouragement. In other words, the reliability of God is greater than our performance. Amen. (laughs) Well, I think of the many times I've blown it and I haven't stood up for him when I should. And if we're faithless, if we're not faithful to God, what about that? And his answer, don't worry about it. He remains faithful to you. Aren't you glad salvation is of God and not man? (laughs) Wow. Let's close with prayer. 
Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word and the encouragement it is to our hearts. We all need to be strong in your grace. Seems like we're all trying to do your work in our own energy, and it's so exhausting how we need the strength that comes from you. And Lord, I realize that our need for that is because we're not to be ashamed of the gospel. And sometimes in a situation where we work or live, we're pressured to the point that we just don't feel strong enough to stand up for the Lord. Perhaps we're afraid about what it might mean for our job, the acceptance of others. There are many things that we face, and you've told us in this wonderful epistle that God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of, this, of a sound mind. So if we're afraid... We know it doesn't come from you, and we're not strong in your grace. So, God, I pray that you would help all of us who claim the, the Lord Jesus as our Savior and Master of our life. You'd help all of us to see the seriousness of what we're talking about here. I would ask, God, that you would straighten out our priorities, because there are many of us that have lost sight of the fact that you have us here to share the gospel with people, that they'd come to know the Lord that our investment of time and energy and whatever we're doing has a priority running through it, and that's to see lost people saved. And I pray, God, that you'd restore that in all of our hearts, no matter what our part may be in that. Give us encouragement from your word, Lord, to know that one day it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. And I pray for those that may be in our audience and are not really sure of where they stand in their relationship to you, that they'll see that Jesus Christ is the only way to God. There is no other hope. There is no other way. It was he who died and paid for our sins and rose again that we would live forever with him. God, help us to respond to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.